Let me start by saying that uh, Adam Smith, who's regarded as the father of modern economics, uh, inspired a lot of disciples who took his message much too literally, his invisible hand story. It's really quite a remarkable story, the idea that if you turn selfish people loose and get them to trade for their own ends, that you'll get socially benign results emerging from that. Often you do. Uh, producers look for cost-saving innovations to try and steal market share for their rivals. Consumers, in the end, get lower prices and better products. That's really quite a remarkable story. Uh, more remarkable still, to my eye, that no one had managed to tell it until the late 1700s. Uh, what, a, what an astonishing thing. All the smart people who wrote before him, nobody had quite codified that. Smith, however, didn't think uh, for a minute that you always got good results when you turned selfish people loose. Uh, he was uh, way more circumspect than that. I think, though, that uh, it will be at some point in the future that we'll correctly recognize not Smith, but rather Charles Darwin as the father of modern economics. Uh, if it was Smith's idea that, uh, or the, his modern disciples' interpretation of, of his idea that led us into the wilderness in the current economic downturn, I think it will be Darwin's insert, insights that point the way forward. The insight of his that I think was the most important in this context is that competition focuses on the individual organism. Uh, traits are selected not for their effects on groups, although there are occasionally interesting examples when that can happen. Primarily, traits are selected for their effect on the reproductive success of individual organisms. There are many traits that benefit the individual and the group at once. So if there's a mutant gene for keener eyesight in hawks, that helps the individual hawk who has the gene. It also helps hawks generally. There's no conflict. Many other traits benefit individuals, however, uh, and are positively detrimental to the group. And I think that's where competition tends to go awry. Let me give a, a simple example. If I seem to be uh, giving repetitive examples, I'm uh, really taking a page from studies of the introductory economics course, which have shown that it leaves no measurable trace on students. So six months, <laughs> six months after we teach them, uh, what, or what we try to teach them what we know, uh, which is generally way uh, more than we ought to try to teach them, uh, we give them tests that probe their knowledge of basic economic principles, and they don't score any better than students who never took the course at all. It's really quite <laughs> discouraging. Uh, I, I wondered for a while, why don't we see malpractice suits uh, filed against economists because they're charging $40,000 a year tuition in the U.S. Uh, and, and adding no value, that doesn't seem like uh, reasonable service to provide. And I think the answer is that no one in, out in the world knows any economics either, or hardly anybody does, so it's not evident that we send students out untrained in economics. <laughs> so here's a story. Uh, I think if we focus our uh, courses on a couple of narratives that encapsulate the main ideas, students could leave with a lot more under their belt. So here, Here's one quick story I'll tell that encapsulates the main message of the talk I'm going to give today. Uh, and it's an example of a trait that benefits the individual but not the group. Uh, so the question Darwin uh, would have asked is, why are the bull elephant seals, that's the animal on the right, so much bigger than the cows? The, the bull weighs uh, 3,000 kilograms. It's, a, it's an enormous animal. Uh, the cow weighs one-fifth that. Uh, why this huge despair. It's not because it's good for bulls to be big. Uh, they have to eat prodigious quantities of fish to get to maintain their body weight. They suffer all manner of orthopedic ailments because they're so massive. Uh, mainly the handicap of size is that they don't uh, get away nearly as well as they would if they were half as big from their main predator, which is the great white shark. Uh, so if they could all, at the count of three, push the red button and shrink by half, they would have a compelling reason to do that. Uh, but they can't do that. They're stuck being so big. Well, how'd they get to be so big in the first place? Uh, Darwin's reasoning was that these are members of a polygynous species. That's a species where males take more than one mate if they can. You have to stress the qualifier because if some get more than one, that means others don't get any at all. And in that case, you don't get to pass the genes for your stuff along into the next generation. You're the ultimate loser in the Darwinian scheme. 
So you're going to do what you can to avoid that outcome if you're a bull elephant seal. And uh, what happens is that they fight bitterly with one another for access to females. The, the, the bulls pair off on the beach and just pummel one another for four or five hours until one lumbers off exhausted and bloodied and scarred, unable to continue. The winner claims a harem of anywhere from 50 to 100 cows, uh, near exclusive sexual access uh, to these cows. If the reason he was the winner was that he had a slight mutation coding for, for bigger size, then that mutation's going to show up in the pups of all these cows on the beach. Uh, and then it will continue. It will get reinforced in another round, and they'll get bigger and bigger through the generation. Not without limit. They don't weigh 60,000 pounds. Uh, it's basically an equilibrium, but it's an inefficient. Okay, hold that, that thought. I'm going to come back to that, that narrative. The, the current downturn uh, is the worst one we've seen since the Great Depression. Someone uh, raised his hand when I claimed that and said, well, what about the 83 downturn? The unemployment rate was higher then. Uh, yes, uh, I think it will get higher in this one than it was in the 83 downturn. But it's worse in the following sense. The rate of decline of output and employment in the early stages of this downturn vastly steeper than anything we saw during the, the Great Depression. Had we not taken vigorous action to try to do something about this downturn, I think we would have seen a downturn that was as great or greater than the Great Depression. So world output's going to fall 2% this year. That hasn't happened uh, on that scale. Nothing like that's happened since the Great Depression. Uh, it's a very sad situation. There are uh, people shedding tears about it. Uh, Inevitably, some make jokes about it. Uh, it's better probably to laugh than to cry. I looked for a joke uh, to tell you. Here's one I found that I like. So the question is this. What's the difference between a pigeon and an investment banker? The, the answer is that a pigeon can still make a deposit on a Ferrari. Uh, <laughs> when the Great Depression struck in the United States, we didn't have a clue what to do. Herbert Hoover thought we needed to balance the budget. And with tax receipts falling as incomes fell, that meant slashing budgets. Uh, and that was exactly the wrong thing to be doing. In the car on the way over here, I heard the Conservative Party uh, uh, in, in the debate in Parliament calling for a 10% across the board cut in spending and berating the Labor Party for borrowing money to, to spend during the current situation. Uh, by my analysis, the Labor Party has got this one right and the Conservative Party has it wrong. Uh, the Conservative Party is quite right to be worried about piling up debt going forward, uh, and I'll, I'll be talking a lot about that. But for the short run, piling up debt is not the problem. What we learned in 1936 was that the solution to a severe downturn is to spend more right away. This was Keynes's main message. It's hard to fault. Hoover for not knowing it. Keynes hadn't written it down uh, 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 when Hoover was in office. Uh, you, you're not going to get out of a, a, a big downturn autonomously. Consumers aren't going to spend. They're worried about uh, losing their jobs if they haven't already. Investors have no reason to invest. They can already produce more than people are willing to buy at current prices. Uh, we're stuck. The only actor on the scene with any capacity to make a difference is government. Government can print money or borrow money and spend it. Uh, one of the interesting insights in Keynes's narrative was that it would be good even if we spent the money on useless tasks, like digging holes and filling them back up again. The digger of the hole would get paid. He would then go spend money at the grocer. The grocer would get money and spend it at the, at the tailor and so on. You'd get the familiar multiplier effect. Prime the pump, that was Keynes's message. If you're going to prime the pump, though, why bother having people dig holes and fill them up? Uh, that would be stupid if you had anything else you could do that was more useful. In the US, we're awash in useful projects that need doing. We've been attacking the public sector budget for three, four decades now with a vengeance. Uh, we've got overdue maintenance in every sphere. This is the I-35 bridge that collapsed over the Mississippi River going into Minneapolis a couple of years ago. Rich and poor suffer when we don't invest in infrastructure. You can see it right at the top of the bridge. There's a BMW getting set to, to 
tumble into the river. There were uh, a number of people killed in that episode, and there are thousands of bridges in every state that are overdue for maintenance. We've got plenty of people who are able to work on these, and spending that money right now to put them to work would be a really good thing to do. But what about looking ahead? If, if we look ahead, we're going to come out of the downturn. That's, there, there are already uh, some signs that uh, a glimmering of recovery is on the horizon. Uh, I'm surprised, frankly, that uh, as many people are saying that as are, but I hope it's true. But pundits looking forward predict misery nonetheless. For one thing, private consumption is not going to reach 2007 levels anytime soon. Well, uh, how could it? It was uh, at unrealistically high levels then. People were borrowing uh, money against what they thought was equity in their homes. It wasn't equity in their homes. It was nonsense prices uh, from a housing bubble, and they can't be borrowing uh, against that non-existent equity anymore. So, so consumption is going to be frozen for quite a while below its peak levels. And Going forward, there's just a, an avalanche of debt we're staring at. That threatens to impoverish our children and grandchildren. I'm going to argue that things are not so bad as all that. For one thing, consumption's smaller than it was before, so what? Uh, think back to when you were in, in college. Uh, those of you uh, who, who have been through college, uh, probably you were poorer then, but uh, if you're an average person, you were no less happy than you are now. The happiness figures show quite clearly that the happiness levels don't vary much over the life, life cycle, even though in, income varies quite substantially over the life cycle. So if you have a little less income and people like you also have a little less income, that's no big deal. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Nepal. I had a tiny income compared to uh, what I was used to having, and it didn't take uh, more than a couple of hours for that to seem totally normal. Uh, we don't hear people from the Depression saying, how awful it was. Uh, there were hard times, but the fact that people had lower incomes, that was not the problem. In terms of the crushing debt burden, there's a really simple solution to that. Uh, this is going to seem too good to be true. I'm going to try to lay out the argument in a simple way and then invite your criticisms of it. Uh, I've, I've not yet seen a fatal flaw in the argument. So, by changing the mix of what we tax, I'm going to claim we can, uh, we can really generate all the revenue we need without really giving up anything. So here's the key insight. Uh, most people focus on the fact that a tax generates revenue. It does, but it also discourages the thing we tax. Uh, that's very important. Uh, the current tax system uh, taxes things we should not be discouraging. We should not be discouraging saving. When we tax income, we tax not just your consumption, but your, your saving. It was a lack of savings that helped precipitate the downturn. We should not be taxing saving. We should not be taxing uh, job creation. In the US, the payroll tax discourages job creation. Uh, there are lots of things we shouldn't tax. What we should tax is activities that cause harm to others. If we tax those, we'll discourage them. Not only does that not cause waste, that reduces waste. These are activities that are being pursued to excess right now. If we tax them, we'll have a bigger pie, and from that bigger pie, we can harvest resources to pay for the things that really will make a difference to us. Okay, a snake oil claim, it has uh, every air of being that. We can raise all the revenue we need without giving up anything uh, important. Let's see. We're used to hearing that the real waste is in the public sector. Well, it's not in the public sector. There is waste in the public sector, and some of it's vivid. We hear in the US about the Pentagon $640 toilet seat. Uh, no consumer would ever buy one that expensive, and so that uh, purports to make the case that uh, you know how to spend your own money more carefully than any bureaucrat in Washington. That's the sentence that we hear from the right wing that's been so effective uh, for so many years in the US. This particular example is not a, not a well-chosen one because it was a toilet seat for the space shuttle. It had special properties. Uh, the, the government does spend money on things that it shouldn't. There's no question about that. I know you've had your own recent examples of government spending uh, money on things that uh, it ought not to have been uh, spending on. So no denying that there's waste in government uh, uh, right up front, but it's trivial uh, compared to the waste in the private sector. Not only that, it's very hard to get rid of the waste in the public sector. Government programs have constituents. If you try to cut, and everybody's tried to cut in the US in, in the last 
administrations. What you cut is what you can cut, not what you should cut. So the Bush administration, the champions of, uh, of eliminating government waste, what did they cut? One thing they cut was the Energy Department's budget for rounding up loose nuclear materials in the former Soviet Union. These are materials that are guarded by soldiers who drink too much, who don't get paid regularly, who don't have good fences around their facilities. They're ripe for a bribe from a terrorist, and it'd be easy to smuggle out if the terrorist got uh, his hands on these materials. We should be rounding these up as fast as possible. We cut the budget for that. That was, that was one, and, and there's a whole laundry list of things. Uh, you have to wonder, what would be the sense of cutting that? The waste in the private sector is actually vastly larger than government waste. Uh, and I'll give some examples of, of the kind of waste I mean. Not only that, it's way easier to ferret out than waste in the public sector. So where's the waste in the private sector coming from? It's not because people are spending more than they need to on toilet seats. If somebody buys a toilet seat, pretty much all the time it's bought at cost. Uh, the competitive market's just like Adam Smith says it was in that regard, prices are kept pretty close to the cost of production. Where we see waste is how much do I need to spend to achieve my goal? There we see social forces entering into that, uh, to the answer to that question in a way that makes the answer re really quite wasteful. One example, uh, Aristotle Anassis, the late shipping magnate from Greece, wanted a special yacht. Uh, so he commissioned uh, a naval architect to transform a, a retired Canadian frigate it was a quite magnificent, it was over 100 meters long. It had a swimming pool with a mosaic tile uh, floor that at the push of a button would rise from the water and become a dance floor in the evening. The bar stools uh, in the bar on the Christina had footrests made of whale ivory, uh, very, very uh, ex uh, expensive and, and rare substance. The, the leather on the stools was from the penis of the sperm whale, uh, apparently. Of, a choice material. Uh, he got a special yacht. Uh, he spent a lot, and he got it. He got what he wanted. Uh, Stavros Niarchos, uh, the arch rival in the shipping industry, uh, to Onassis, wanted a special yacht too, and so he gave his naval architect explicit instructions. He didn't know how long the Christina was. He said, "Build the Atlantis too, 50 feet longer." than the Christina. He got a special yacht. But they both spent a bundle, uh, and they could have gotten special yachts if each of them had spent half that much. The bull, elephant, seals, one of them would have won, one of them would have lost if each of them had weighed half as much. Uh, your, uh, your own distinguished uh, Lord Richard Laird uh, wrote in a, in a uh, well-cited uh, 1980 paper, in a poor country, a man proves to his wife that he loves her by giving her a rose. In a rich country, he must give a dozen roses. Does anyone doubt that context matters in that way? Uh, I've got my 25th anniversary coming up in October. Uh, if I lived in Nepal, uh, I would be spending much less on the gift I'm going to buy uh, uh, in, in October than I'll be spending now. This is just a total commonplace. Suppose you want to have a special occasion for your child's coming of age uh, celebration. What do you need to spend to do that? Well, uh, it would be surprising if the answer didn't depend on context. If you're in the very upper reaches of the economic uh, hierarchy, you got to spend quite a bit. One CEO in the US recently spent 10 million on his daughter's coming of age party. He hired the rapper 50 Cent. He hired Aerosmith. He invited 300 of her closest friends to the Rainbow Room atop Rockefeller Center. It was a magnificent celebration, but $10 million was not a cheap celebration. Uh, he's not a bad person, he just wanted a special occasion. If it were just a handful of people spending at that level, it'd, it'd be of no concern, but you get a cascade. So they spend more on special occasions. The people in the middle don't try to copy them. They can't uh, possibly copy them, but the people who are just below them are influenced. Uh, the standards that define special occasions in their circle uh, are influenced by what people at the top spend. And so when I was going last month to my office at NYU, where I've been on sabbatical this year, I saw a clown getting out of her car and going into one of the NYU faculty apartment buildings. I wondered, well, what's, what's the clown going in, in there for? And then I realized that, of course, it's now become the custom if your 10-year-old's having a birthday party 
to hire a professional clown or a magician and that the kids will be disappointed if you don't have some professional entertainer at the birthday party. It cascades down and affects spending at every level. I bought a gas grill uh, in the early, uh, in, in the, the late 90s uh, to replace my old one that I'd bought in the late 80s. Uh, I couldn't believe the new things that were on offer in the 10 years since then. There was some, one that the salesman tried to sell me, 15,000 BTU burners, two of them on one side. Uh, that's a lot, right? Uh, why would they say if it wasn't a lot? Yeah, it's twice as much as an ordinary kitchen range. Why do you need so much? Uh, if you're going to do flash ethnic stir fry, you need the extra heat to sear the flavor in. Uh, he told me. Well, I didn't, I didn't buy it uh, when he showed me that one. Uh, then he showed me the value model, only one 15,000 BTU burner. Uh, no infrared rotisserie, no, uh, no uh, potato warmer. But professional value at a value price, the same results you'd get, uh, $1,160 it was. Uh, I could have bought that. I didn't. I could have bought it, though, and thought, wow, you were a pretty prudent shopper there. You didn't fall for the chump model with all the bells and whistles. I wrote about this. And ever since then, people have been sending me brochures describing the latest <laughs> offerings. There's one that came out recently. That's where the money's going. All the income gains have been going to the top. Uh, you know, you have more money, what should I buy? Buy something cool. Well, what's cool? That's cool. Uh, <laughs> is that the best place for the next dollar to go if you have pressing needs to meet? Uh, when everybody buys a bigger grill, that just raises the bar that defines how big a grill people feel they need. Consider that possibility. Victoria's Secret has a catalog each Christmas that has a bejeweled bra in it. This one cost $12.5 million. They've never sold one. I talked to the marketing director. I said they're not worried about that. They get good publicity every time uh, it comes out. They have a photo shoot. And they harvest the jewels and recycle them. Uh, and people see that in the catalog and then think buying the $340 teddy is a, is a bargain. Uh, they were a prudent shopper when they buy that gift. If you need more money, one way to get it is to harvest some expenditure out of this stream here. Everybody's building bigger houses. Why? Because other people, like us, have bigger houses, and that's the style in which we're expected to live and entertain. We've got to do it, too. If you slowed the rate of growth of expenditure in those categories, you could divert those same funds into other categories that have more pressing uses. Uh, I was listening in the car to the debate on what's getting cut. You know, there are a lot of, lot of muscle being cut from the, the budget, both here in the UK and in the US. So here, here's my proposal. Progressive consumption tax, better marketing name, the unlimited savings allowance tax. So here's the basic income identity. Income equals consumption plus savings. That means you report your income to the tax authorities the same as you do now. Report how much you save this year. People do that for tax-free retirement accounts. Your consumption is just the difference between those two numbers. Quite simple. Take off a big standard deduction, that's your taxable consumption. So here's the Jones family. Annual income, 50,000 pounds. Annual savings, 5,000. Standard deduction, 30,000. Taxable in consumption, 15,000 pounds. Tax rate, 20%, 3,000 pounds tax. Simple. Then the tax rate starts going up from its initial low level, and it goes up and up and up and up. And it's not constrained in the same way that the top tax rate is on income, because if we raise the top tax rate on income too much, we will discourage savings and investment. That's the standard fear. Uh, here, if you raise the top tax rate on consumption, not only do you not discourage saving and investment, you encourage them. Consider this example. You've got a family already spending 5 million pounds a year. Should they add a two million pound wing onto their mansion? That's what they're trying to decide. If you look at my tax and suppose that there was a 100% marginal tax rate on somebody consuming five million pounds a year, that means instead of having to spend two million pounds to add the wing, they'd have to still pay the contractor two million pounds, but then they'd have to pay the tax authorities an additional two million pounds, so four million pounds. Ooh. 
We hadn't planned on spending that much, and so they decided to scale back and add only a one million pound addition onto the mansion. Tax, one million dollars, so it cost them two million, the same as the original one twice as large would have cost them. Everyone else facing the same incentive in their peer group decides similarly to scale back, and lo and behold, no one's any less happy than before. The, the people are consuming less, uh, uh, they're saving more, the government's getting more tax revenue, and nobody's any worse off. That's the snake oil part of the proposal. Free money out of thin air. Okay, I'll, I'll rush through the end so we've got uh, time for questions and answers. There's plenty of harmful activities to tax besides consumption at high levels. You know, if somebody throws a special party for $10 million, He's not trying to harm anybody else, but uh, the fact is he does harm others by raising the bar that they have to meet to, to indicate that they understand the importance of the occasion. Uh, so taxing consumption at a progressive rate, that's taxing a harmful activity in that sense. We have to tax something, why not tax harmful activities because that makes the pie bigger. Tax carbon, we could slow global warming and generate a lot of revenue if we did that. You've got the right idea here. We couldn't pull the trigger on this policy. The congestion fee is a perfect example of taxing harmful behavior. You get on a crowded road, you harm others. You make them take longer to get where they're going. Take that cost into account by having to pay a fee, the congestion fee. That fee generates revenue that can be used to buy useful things, and people can figure out ways to adapt that are not very costly. So there are all sorts of non-carbon pollutants we can tax. You want to Talk on your mobile phone, well, pay a fine when you do it. You're putting the rest of us at risk when you do that. Uh, it's a harmful activity. Driving a heavy passenger vehicle, you're putting my family at risk. You're damaging the roads. Pay a fee when you do that. Pay a tax when you do that. Outside my apartment in New York this year, uh, there was construction on the road uh, that we looked out onto. And so the, the traffic was backed up frequently. People honked in that situation. Did, had absolutely no effect on the traffic. The traffic was blocked up because they had nowhere to go. So how does honking help? Answer, it doesn't help at all, but it imposes harm on us in the apartment. Put a cop out there and charge the money if they want to keep honking. <laughs> a tax on financial transactions. There's all sorts, take a walk, I'll tax your feet. I mean, there are all sorts of uh, harmful activities out there begging to be taxed, and taxes on them make the pie bigger, not smaller. Okay. Boost government spending as much as possible, paid for with debt by printing money, however you can figure out how to do it in the short run. Uh, don't listen to people who say you ought to cut the budget and, and uh, ba ba balance off the, the accounts during a downturn. That's, that's totally wrong-headed advice to be given. But don't say deficits don't matter in the long run. They do matter. Uh, so tax more tomorrow. Uh, enact taxes now, have them phase in gradually. If we enacted a progressive consumption tax now that was going to take effect once the economy reached full employment again, that would provide immediate stimulus because it would put you on notice that you can spend now and escape the consumption tax that's coming. So it's two birds with one stone. We're trying to move, in other words, from a borrow and consume economy to a save and invest economy. We can do that. We'll have higher growth in the long run, consumption will be just as high in short order and eventually higher, even though it'll be a smaller proportion of the national income. Uh, and we can, through judicious choice of what to tax, take care of the harmful environmental effects of consumption at the same time. So thank you very much for turning out. I know it was hard to get here today. It was hard for me to get here too. We have time. Uh, Tim, you, you can, uh, I think they've given you some time for a brief response and then we can open it up. Brilliant. Bob, thanks very much.